Simon and Schuster Audio presents The Seven Habits of Highly Effective Teens, written and read by Sean Covey. Welcome. I'm Sean, and I wrote the book called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective Teens that this program is based on. Now, I don't know how you got this program. Maybe your mom gave it to you to shape you up. Or maybe you bought it with your own money because the title caught your eye. Regardless of how it landed in your hands, I'm really glad that it did. Now you just need to listen to it. This program is based on a book that my dad, Stephen R. Covey, wrote several years ago entitled The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Surprisingly, that book has become one of the best-selling books of all time. But my dad owes a lot of the credit for the success of his book to me and my brothers and sisters, you see. Because we were his guinea pigs. He tried out all of his psycho experiments on us. And that's why all of my brothers and sisters have brain damage. Hey, I'm just kidding, siblings. Luckily, I escaped uninjured. So why did I make this program? I did it because life for teens is no longer a playground. It's a jungle out there. I'll give you a set of tools to help you deal with real life. What are these tools? They are the seven habits of highly effective teens. Or, to put it another way, the seven characteristics that happy and successful teenagers from all over the world have in common. Before we move into the habits, we're now going to move into part one, the setup. This will help give us the foundation for better understanding what the seven habits are. Let me start by explaining what habits really are. Habits are things that we repeatedly do, but most of the time we are hardly aware that we even have them. Now, some habits are good, such as the habit of regular exercise, planning ahead, and showing respect for others. Other habits are bad. You may have the habit of thinking negatively, for example, or feeling inferior and blaming others. And some habits don't really matter. Depending upon what they are, our habits will either make us or break us. Luckily, you are stronger than your habits. At any time, you can look yourself in the mirror and say, hey, I don't like that about myself. And you can exchange a bad habit for a better one. Not every idea in this program will work for you. But you don't have to be perfect to see results either. Just living some of the habits some of the time can help you experience changes in your life that you never thought possible. The seven habits can help you increase your self-confidence, define your values and decide what's most important to you, and help you find that very important balance between your schooling, your work, your friends, and everything else that you're involved in. So what do you say? Make my day and keep listening. We'll now move into paradigms and principles. What you see is what you get. The following three statements were made many years ago. At the time they were said, they sounded intelligent, but with the passing of time, they sound idiotic. Kenneth Olson, the president and founder of Digital Equipment Corporation, or DAC, said in 1977, quote, there is no reason for any individual to have a computer in their home. DECA Records, who rejected the Beatles in 1962, said, we don't like their sound. Groups of guitars are on the way out. And listen to this one. Charles H. Duell, the U.S. Commissioner of Patents, said in 1899, if you can believe it, quote, everything that can be invented has been invented. Now, having heard these all-time stupid quotes, let me share with you some other statements made by real teens just like you. You've heard them before, and they are just as ridiculous as the quotes I just gave you. No one in my family has ever gone to college. I'd be crazy to think that I could make it. Or... It's no use. My stepdad and I will never get along. We're just way too different. Or, she's so pretty, I'll bet she's a jerk. What do these two groups of statements have in common? First, they are all perceptions about the way things are. Second, they are all inaccurate or incomplete, even though the people who said them think that they're true. Another word for perceptions is paradigms. A paradigm is the way you see something. It's your point of view. And our paradigms are often way off the mark. And as a result, they create limitations. Think about the teen who believes that she can't get along with her stepdad. If that is her paradigm or her perception, is she ever likely to get along with him? 
Probably not because that very belief will hold her back. Paradigms are like a pair of glasses. When you have incomplete paradigms about yourself, it's like wearing glasses with the wrong prescription. That lens affects how you see everything else. If you believe you're dumb, for example, that very belief will make you dumb. On the other hand, if you believe you're smart, that belief will cast a rosy hue on everything else you do and see. Now, if you have a stifling paradigm of yourself, how can you improve it? One way that I found that helps is to spend time with someone who believes in you, someone who builds you up. Growing up, my mom always believed in me, especially when I doubted myself. She was always saying stuff like, Sean, of course you should run for class president. And, Sean, ask her out. I'm sure she would just die to go out with you. Whenever I needed to be affirmed, I'd talk to my mom, and she'd help me wipe my glasses clean. Ask any successful person, and most will tell you that they had a person who believed in them. It only takes one person, and it doesn't really matter who it is. Don't be afraid to lean upon this person and to get nourished by them. Go to them for advice. Try to see yourself the way they see you. We have paradigms not only about ourselves, but also about other people, and they can be way out of whack, too. Seeing things from a different point of view can help us understand why other people act the way they do sometimes. I once spoke with a teenager named Becky who told me this story about a paradigm shift she experienced with a friend. As a junior in high school, I had a friend named Kim. She was essentially a nice person, but as the year progressed, it became more and more difficult to get along with her. She was easily offended and often felt left out. She was moody and difficult to be around. Eventually, we stopped inviting her to things. I was gone for a good part of the summer after that year, and when I returned, I was talking to a good friend of mine, catching up on all the news. She was telling me about all the gossip, the different romances, and so on, when suddenly she said, Oh, did I tell you about Kim? She's been having a hard time lately because her parents are going through a really messy divorce. When I heard this, my whole perspective changed. Rather than being annoyed by Kim's behavior, I felt terrible about my own. I felt I had deserted her in her time of need. Just by knowing that one little bit of information, my whole attitude towards her changed. How do you think Becky will treat Kim the next time she sees her? Think about it. And to think that all it took to change her paradigm was a smidgen of new information. If you'll look closely, you'll find that most of your problems in your life with things like relationships, self-image, your attitude, are usually the result of a messed up paradigm or two. Hopefully, this program will help you create more accurate and complete paradigms. Besides having paradigms about ourselves and other people, we also have paradigms about the world as a whole. Whatever is most important to you will become your paradigm, or as I like to call it, your life center. Some of the more popular life centers for teens include things like friends, centering your life around your friends and how important they are to you, stuff, a boyfriend or a girlfriend, and who hasn't been centered on a boyfriend or girlfriend at one time or another, school, even your parents. You can center your life on your parents, or things like sports and hobbies. Each of the centers I just mentioned all have their good points, but they all are incomplete in one way or another, and if you center your life on them, they'll mess you up. For example, think about your friends. What if you center your life on your friends? Friends are important, and we should do everything we can to build great friendships. But if you base your entire life and build your self-esteem on the foundation of friends, you are in for some big problems because it's an unstable foundation. Why? Because sometimes they talk behind your back, sometimes they're disloyal, sometimes they get up and move or you move, and then where are you? Or take sports. Let's say you're a great basketball player and you build your entire life around being that great player. What happens to you one day when you're out playing and you blow out your knee? Where are you then? Luckily, there's one center that you can always count on. It's being principle-centered. We are all familiar with the effects of gravity. You throw a ball up and it comes down. It's a natural law or principle. Just as there are principles that rule the physical world, there are also principles that rule the human world. If you live by them, you will excel. If you break them, you will fail. It's that simple. 
Honesty is a principle. Service is a principle. Hard work is a principle. Things like responsibility and fairness and integrity are principles. There are dozens and dozens more. They are not hard to identify. Just like a compass always points to true north, your heart will recognize true principles. It takes faith to live by principles, especially when you look around and you see people close to you that get ahead by doing things like cheating and lying and manipulating and serving only themselves. What you don't see, however, is that when people break principles, it always catches up to them in the end. Decide today to make principles your life center or paradigm. For every problem, there is usually a principle that will solve it. If you're feeling worn out or beat up by life, perhaps the principle that you need is balance. If you find that no one is trusting you, that nobody believes you, maybe the principle of honesty is what you need. Principles will never let you down. They won't talk behind your back. They won't get up and move. You'll discover that each of the seven habits is based upon a basic principle or two. The long and short of it is principles rule. Okay, we've now finished the first section and now we're moving into the second. I call it the private victory. We're going to get into the habits in just a minute, but first we're going to talk about the personal bank account and then we'll talk about habits one, two, and three. If you want to make a change in your life, the place to begin is with yourself. All change begins with you. This program is all about changing from the inside out because that's where change starts, not the outside in. Before getting into habit one, let's take a look at how you can immediately begin to build your self-confidence and achieve what I call a private victory. Succeeding with yourself always comes before succeeding with other people, and that's why we start here, with yourself. How you feel about yourself is like a bank account. Let's call it your personal bank account, or for short, your PBA. Just like a checking or savings account at a bank, you can make deposits into and take withdrawals from your PBA by the things that you think about, the things that you say, and the things that you do. For example, when I stick to a commitment I've made to myself, I feel in control. It's a deposit. On the other hand, when I break a promise to myself, I feel disappointed and I make a withdrawal. How is your PBA? Is it rich or poor? Signs of a poor PBA might be things like caving into peer pressure very easily, wrestling with feelings of depression or inferiority. On the other hand, signs of a strong PBA or a personal bank account might include things like standing up for yourself, resisting peer pressure, seeing life as a generally positive experience, and being happy when other people succeed. If your personal bank account is low, don't worry. Just start today by making $1, $5, $10, or $50 deposits. Small deposits over a long period of time is the only way to a healthy personal bank account. There are no shortcuts. After talking with a lot of different teen groups, I've compiled a list of six key deposits for your personal bank account. They include keeping promises to yourself, or in other words, if you set a goal to get up at 6 a.m. tomorrow morning, then do it and make that deposit. Two, do small acts of kindness, it's amazing how good it makes you feel when you help other people. Three, be gentle with yourself. This means forgiving yourself when you make mistakes, and don't we all? And then not expecting yourself to be perfect overnight. Four, be honest. Telling the truth all the time makes you feel whole inside and will make you feel good all over. Five, renew yourself. Set apart time every day to relax and to kick back and to do whatever you need to do to renew yourself. And six, develop your talents and interests. Let's talk about developing your talents and interests for a moment. Finding and developing a talent or interest and then working hard to get good at it can be one of the single greatest deposits you can make into your PBA. Why is it that when we think of talents, we think in terms of the traditional high-profile talents, such as the athlete or the singer or the dancer or the sterling scholar? You may have a gift for being creative or being a fast learner or being accepting of other people. You may have organization or leadership skills. It doesn't matter where your talent may lie. 
when you do something you like doing and that you have a talent for, it's exhilarating and a great big deposit into your PBA. So if you need a shot of confidence, start making some deposits into your PBA starting today. You will feel the results immediately. And remember, there are many, many ways to do it. You find what works for you. Now we're ready to move into the habits, beginning with Habit 1, Be Proactive. Habit 1, Be Proactive is the key to unlocking all the other habits, and that's why it comes first. Habit 1 says, I am the captain of my life. I'm responsible for my own happiness or unhappiness. Being proactive is the first step towards achieving the private victory. Can you imagine doing algebra before learning addition and subtraction? Not going to happen. The same goes for the seven habits. You can't do habits two, three, four, five, six, and seven before you do habit one. That's because until you feel you are in charge of your own life, nothing else is really possible. Now is it? Think about it. Every day, you and I have about 100 chances to be either proactive or reactive. A great way to understand the proactive mindset is to compare proactive and reactive responses to situations that happen all the time to you and me. For example, you overhear your best friend badmouthing you in front of a group. She doesn't know you overheard the conversation. Just five minutes ago, this same friend was sweet-talking you to your face. You feel hurt and betrayed. If you're a reactive person, you might have a number of different responses. For example, you could tell your friend off. You could even hit her. You could go into a deep depression because you feel so bad about what she said. Or you could even decide that she's a two-faced liar and give her the silent treatment for two months. You could also spread vicious rumors about her. After all, she does deserve it. On the other hand, if you're a proactive person, you might decide to forgive her. Or you could confront her and then share with her how you feel about what she said about you. You could also ignore her behavior completely and just give her a second chance. Maybe you realize that she has weaknesses just like you and that occasionally you talk behind her back without really meaning any harm. Reactive people suffer from a contagious virus I call victimitis. People infected with victimitis believe that everyone has it in for them and that the world owes them something. Besides feeling like victims, reactive people are easily offended and change only when they have to. But proactive people are a different breed entirely. They bounce back when something bad happens, and they focus on things they can do something about and don't worry about things they can't. In reality, you and I aren't either completely proactive or reactive, but probably somewhere in between. The key, then, is to make being proactive a habit so that you don't even have to think about it. The fact is we can't control everything that happens to us. But there is one thing we can control. We can control how we respond to what happens to us, and that is what counts. Life often deals us a bad hand, and it is up to us to see how we're going to respond to it. Every time we have a setback, it's an opportunity for us to turn it into a triumph. I hope and believe that you will be proactive and strong in these key moments. So when someone is rude to you, where do you get the power to resist being rude back? Sometimes life is moving so fast that we instantly react to everything just out of sheer habit. If you can learn to pause, get control, and think about how you want to respond, you will make much better and smarter decisions. Each of us will face an extraordinary challenge or two in our lives, and we can choose whether to rise to or to be conquered by them. After all that's been said and done, the choice is yours. We're now ready to move into Habit 2, Begin with the End in Mind. Habit 2, Begin with the End in Mind, means developing a clear picture of where you want to go with your life. It means deciding what your values are and setting goals. Habit 1 says, you are the driver of your life, not the passenger. Habit 2 says, since you are the driver of your life, decide where you want to go and draw yourself a map to get there. By saying begin with the end in mind, I'm not talking about deciding upon every little detail of your future, like choosing your career or deciding who you're going to marry. I'm simply talking about thinking beyond today and deciding what direction you want to go with your life so that each step you take today is always leading you in the right direction, the direction you want to go. Why is it so important to have an end in mind? 
I'll give you two good reasons. The first is that you are at a critical crossroads in life, and the paths you choose now can affect you forever. It's both frightening and exciting that we have to make so many vital decisions when we're so young and full of hormones, but such is life. Take your choice of friends as an example. The need to be accepted and be part of a group is powerful, but too often we choose our friends based upon whomever will accept us, and that's not always good. It's hard, but sometimes it is really better to have no friends for a period of time than to have the wrong friends. The wrong group can lead you down all kinds of paths you really don't want to take. I have a really close friend who fortunately had enough common sense to drop his old friends for some new ones. This is a story he shared with me. The summer before my senior year, I had a really good friend named Jack. The month before school started, he went to Europe and to my surprise came back with a powerful drug called hashish. Neither of us had ever experimented with drugs before. He began to invite me to join him in using this drug with a group of his new friends. I knew there was no future in any of it and that eventually he would self-destruct if he continued using these drugs. However, he had been my best friend since grade school and I didn't have a lot of other close friends. I didn't want to be a loner, but I also didn't want to end up where I thought Jack was going. I remember finally deciding that it was just too risky to hang out with him anymore. At first I felt awkward, didn't fit in, and felt dumb being alone. But after a few months, I made friends with guys who had similar values and were also a lot of fun. My old friend Jack turned into a druggie, barely graduated, and eventually drowned in a swimming pool while intoxicated. It was very sad, but I was grateful I had the guts to stick with the right decision and think long-term at a crucial time in my life. Hey, if you're having trouble making good friends, remember they don't have to be your age necessarily. I spoke to a guy once who seemed to have very few friends at school, but he did have a grandpa and they were great friends. The long and short of it is just be wise when you choose your friends because much of your future hangs on who you hang out with. So if it is so important to have an end in mind, how do you do it? The best way I've found is to write what I call a personal mission statement. A personal mission statement is like a personal credo or motto which states what your life is all about. Now mission statements come in a variety of forms. Some mission statements are long, others are short, some are poems, some are songs. I've even seen some teenagers use their favorite quote as a mission statement. Others have used a picture or a photograph. So what can writing a mission statement do for you? Tons. Most importantly, it'll open up your eyes to what's really important to you and it will help you make better decisions. A 12th grader once shared with me how writing a mission statement helped her so much in her life and made a big difference. During my junior year, I couldn't concentrate on anything because I had a boyfriend. I wanted to do everything for him to make him happy. And then the subject of sex naturally came up. I felt like I wasn't ready and that I didn't want to have sex, but everyone else kept saying, just do it. Then I participated in a character development class at school where they taught me to write a mission statement. I started to write and kept on writing and writing and kept on adding things to it. It gave me direction and a focus, and I felt like I had a plan and a reason for doing what I was doing. It really helped me to stick to my standards and not to do something I wasn't ready for. A personal mission statement is like a tree with deep roots. It is stable and it isn't going anywhere, but it is also alive and continually growing. You need a tree with deep roots to help you survive all of the storms of life that beat upon you. You can deal with change if you have an immovable trunk to always hang on to. A big mistake that teens make when writing a mission statement is that they spend so much time thinking about making it perfect that they never get started. You're not writing it for your English teacher and it's not going to be graded by anyone, so don't worry about that. The most important question to ask yourself is, does the mission statement inspire me? If you can answer yes to that, then you know you've done it right. Once you have your mission in place, you'll want to set some goals. 
goals are more specific than a mission statement and can help you break down your mission statement into bite-sized pieces. Sometimes when we hear the word goals, we go on a guilt trip. It reminds us of all the goals we should have been setting and the ones that we have blown. Forget about any mistakes you've made in the past. Let me share with you two keys to setting goals that can make all the difference. The first is, write them down. A goal not written is only a wish. On several different occasions, I have asked large groups of teens, how many of you have goals? And most of them raise their hands. I then ask, how many of you have written down your goals? And only about 10% or so raise their hands. The point is, goals that are written have 10 times the power. Second, count the cost. How many times do we start goals when we are in the mood, but then later find out we don't have the strength to follow through? Why does this happen? It usually happens because we haven't counted the cost. Let's pretend you set a goal to get better grades in school this year. But now, before you begin, count the cost. What will it require? For instance, you'll have to spend a lot more time doing math and grammar and a lot less time playing with your friends. Now, having counted the cost, consider the benefits. What could good grades bring you? Now, ask yourself, am I willing to make the sacrifice? If not, then don't do it. Don't make commitments to yourself you know you're going to break because you'll take withdrawals from your own personal bank account. A better way is to make the goal more bite-sized. Instead of setting a goal to get better grades in all of your classes, you might want to set a goal to get better in just one or two of your classes. Then next semester, take another bite. Little by little, you'll get more strength. Counting the cost will always add a touch of needed realism to your goals, and that is so important. Since your destiny is yet to be determined, why not make it extraordinary and leave a lasting legacy? As you do this, remember, life is a mission, not a career, and there's a big difference. A career asks, what's in it for me? While a mission asks, how can I make a difference? Martin Luther King's mission was to ensure civil rights for all people. Mother Teresa's mission was to clothe the naked and to feed the hungry. These are extreme examples. You don't have to change the world to have a mission. As educator Marin Moritzen says, most of us will never do great things, but we can do small things in a great way. Now let's move into Habit 3, Put First Things First. Habit 3, Put First Things First, is all about learning to prioritize and manage your time so that your first things come first and not last. Sure, we can have a nice list of goals and good intentions, but doing them, putting them first, is the hard part. That's why I call Habit 3 the habit of willpower, which is the strength to say yes to your most important things, and the habit of won't power, which is the strength to say no to less important things and to peer pressure. Have you ever packed a suitcase and noticed how much more you can fit inside when you neatly fold and organize your clothes instead of just throwing them in? The same goes for your life. If you better organize yourself, you'll be able to pack more in, more time for family and friends, more time for school, more time for yourself, more time for your first things. I'd like to tell you about a model that can help you pack more into your life, especially important things. I call it the time quadrants. It's made up of two primary ingredients, important and urgent. Important means your most important things, activities that contribute to your mission or to your goals. Urgent means pressing things, activities which demand immediate attention. If you haven't already noticed, we live in a society that is addicted to urgency. Urgent things aren't bad necessarily. The problem comes when we become so focused on urgent things that we put off more important things that aren't urgent, like working on that report way in advance or going for a walk in the mountains. All these important things get pushed aside by urgent things like phone calls and interruptions and other in-your-face, do-it-now things. In general, we spend our time in four different time quadrants resulting from the crossing of important and urgent. Each quadrant contains different kinds of activities and is represented by a type of person. See what type you are. Let's start with quadrant one. We call this person the procrastinator. 
In quadrant one or Q1, everything is both urgent and important. There will always be quadrant one things that we can't control and that must get done, like meeting an important deadline. But we also cause many Q1 headaches because we procrastinate. Q1 is part of life, but if you're spending too much time in Q1, believe me, you'll be a stress case and you'll seldom be performing to your potential. Let's save quadrant two, which is the quadrant we want to be in until the end. We're saving the best one for last. Let's move on to quadrant three. We call this person the yes man. Quadrant three, or Q3, represents things that are urgent but not important. It is characterized by trying to please other people and responding to their every desire. We won't accomplish much if we say yes to everything and say yes to everyone and never learn to focus on what's most important. Quadrant three is one of the worst quadrants to be in because it has no backbone. Now let's go on to quadrant four. We call this person the slacker. Quadrant four is a category of waste and excess. These activities are neither urgent nor important. The slacker loves anything in excess. Going to movies, chatting on the web, or just hanging out are part of a healthy and happy life. We need to do those kinds of things. It's only when they're done in excess that they become a waste. Now back to quadrant two, the prioritizer. Quadrant two, or Q2, is made up of things that are important but not urgent, like relaxation, building friendships, and doing homework in advance and on time. It's the quadrant of excellence, the place that we want to be in. Q2 activities are important but not urgent, and that's why we have trouble doing them. For example, getting a good summer job may be very important to you, but since it's weeks away and not that urgent, you may put off looking for that job until it's too late and suddenly all the good jobs are filled. Had you been in Q2, you would have planned far ahead and found a better job. So, in which quadrant are you spending the majority of your time? Give it some thought. Since in reality we all spend some time in every quadrant, the key then is to shift as much time as possible into Q2. And the only way you'll find more time for Q2 is to reduce the amount of time you spend in the other quadrants. You've got to stop procrastinating. You've got to stop saying yes to everything and to everyone. And you've got to stop being a slacker and wasting time. In addition to spending more time in quadrant two, consider two other suggestions to help you better manage your time. The first is this. I highly recommend using a planner of some sort that has a calendar and space to write down appointments and to-do lists and goals and so forth. With a planner, you'll no longer have to worry about forgetting things or double booking yourself. You can keep all of your important information in one place instead of on 50 scraps of paper all over your room. Second, plan weekly. At the end or at the beginning of every week, take about 15 minutes and think about what you want to accomplish next week. You may have a big test coming up that you want to prepare for. You may have a party you want to attend. You may want to exercise three times. After you have identified the key things that you want to accomplish the next week, go to your planner and schedule them in. Blocking out time in advance is the key to getting your most important things done. Time management isn't all there is to habit three. It's only half of it. The other half is learning to overcome fear and peer pressure. It takes guts to stay true to your first things, like your values and standards when the pressure is on. Let me share with you a few ideas to help you overcome fear and peer pressure. The first is to learn to jump outside of your comfort zone. Your comfort zone is just that, a zone in which you are comfortable. Things like making new friends, speaking before a large audience, or sticking up for your values makes your hair stand on end. Welcome to the courage zone. In this territory waits uncertainty, pressure, and the possibility of failure. But it's also the place to go for opportunity and the only place in which you'll ever reach your full potential. What's that, you asked? What's so wrong about enjoying your comfort zone? Nothing. In fact, much of our time should be spent there. But there is something absolutely wrong with never venturing into unknown waters. You see, fear can prevent us from taking risks. When I think about all I failed to do in my life because my fears got the best of me, I ache inside. One way I've learned to overcome fear is to keep this thought always in the back of my mind. This is it. Winning is nothing more than rising each time you fall. We should worry less about failing and worry more about the chances we miss when we don't even try. One of the keys to overcoming fear and peer pressure 
is to learn to be strong in certain hard moments. Hard moments are conflicts between what we know we should do and what would be the easier thing to do. Hard moments come in two sizes, small and large. Small hard moments occur daily and include things like controlling your temper or disciplining yourself to do your homework. If you can conquer yourself and be strong in these key moments, your days will go so much smoother. In contrast to small hard moments, larger ones occur every so often and include things like resisting negative peer pressure and rebounding after a major setback. These moments have huge consequences and often strike when you're least expecting it. If you recognize that these moments will come, and they always will, then you can prepare for them and meet them head on like a warrior and come out victorious. Be courageous at these key junctures. Don't sacrifice your future happiness for one night of pleasure, a weekend of excitement, or a thrilling moment of revenge. In the final analysis, putting first things first takes discipline. It takes discipline to manage your time. It takes discipline to overcome your fears. It takes discipline to be strong during the hard moments. Sometimes you just got to exercise your special human tool called willpower to get things done, whether you feel like it or not. Here's a final word about Habit 3. We've surveyed thousands of people in the seven habits, and guess what habit is the hardest one to live? You guessed it, it's Habit 3. So don't get discouraged if you struggle with it. You've got company. Your teen years can be some of the most exciting and adventurous years of your life, so make sure that you value and treasure each moment. We just finished talking about the private victory, or habits one, two, and three. We're now ready to move into part three, or the public victory, which is all about building relationships and habits four, five, and six. The relationship bank account. One of my favorite quotes, which always makes me feel guilty, is, on their deathbed, nobody wished they would have spent more time at the office. I've often asked myself, well, what do they wish they would have spent more time doing? I think the answer might be, spent more time with the people they love. You see, it's all about relationships, the stuff that life is made of. So what's it like to be in a relationship with you? Maybe you're doing pretty well, maybe not. Either way, this was designed to help you improve your key relationships. But before we go there, let's quickly review where we've just come from. As we've already discussed, the key to mastering relationships is first mastering yourself at least to some degree. You don't have to be perfect, you just need to be making progress. Why is success with self so important to success with others? It's because the most important ingredient in any relationship is what you are. The private victory will help you become independent so that you can say, I am responsible for myself and I can create my own destiny. This is a huge accomplishment. The public victory will help you become interdependent, that is, help you to learn to work cooperatively with other people so that you can say, I am a team player and I have power and influence with people. This is an even greater accomplishment. Your ability to get along with other people will have a huge impact upon how successful you are in your career and your level of happiness. Now back to talking about relationships. Here's a practical way to think about them. I call it the Relationship Bank Account or the RBA. Earlier we spoke about your personal bank account which represents the amount of trust and confidence you have in yourself. In the same way, the RBA represents the amount of trust and confidence you have in each of your relationships. The RBA is very much like a checking account at a bank. You can make deposits and improve the relationship, or you can take withdrawals and weaken it. A strong and healthy relationship is always the result of steady deposits made over a long period. There are many kinds of deposits, but here are six that seem to work every time. They are, one, doing small acts of kindness, two, keeping promises, three, being loyal, four, listening, five, saying you're sorry, and six, setting clear expectations. Let's focus just for a moment on doing small acts of kindness. Have you ever had a day where everything is going wrong and you feel totally depressed when suddenly, out of nowhere, somebody says something nice to you and it turns your whole day around? Sometimes the littlest things, a kind note, a smile, can make such a big difference. If you want to build friendships, try doing the little things, because in relationships, the little things are the big things.
A friend of mine, Renan, once told me about a thousand dollar deposit her brother made into her RBA. When I was in the ninth grade, my big brother Hans, who was a junior in high school, seemed to me to be the epitome of popularity. He was good in sports and dated a lot. Our house was always filled with his cool friends, guys I dreamed would someday think of me as more than just Hans's dumb little kid sister. Hans asked Rebecca Knight, the most popular girl in the school, to go with him to the junior prom. She accepted. He rented the tux, bought the flowers, and along with the rest of his popular crowd, hired a limo and made reservations to a fancy restaurant. Then disaster struck. On the afternoon of the prom, Rebecca came down with a terrible strain of flu. Hans was without a date, and it was too late to ask another girl. There were a number of ways Hans could have reacted, including getting angry, feeling sorry for himself, blaming Rebecca, even choosing to believe that she wasn't really sick and just didn't want to go with him, in which case he would have to believe that he was a loser. But Hans chose not only to be proactive, but to give someone else the night of her life. He asked me, me, his little sister, to go with him to his junior prom. Can you imagine my ecstasy? Mom and I flew about the house getting me ready. But when the limo pulled up with all of his friends, I almost chickened out. What would they think? But Hans just grinned, gave me his arm, and proudly escorted me out to the car like I was the queen of the ball. He didn't warn me not to act like a kid. He didn't apologize to the others. He ignored the fact that I was dressed in a simple, short-skirted piano recital dress, while all of the other girls were in elegant formals. Everyone was wonderful to me the whole night, and I think part of the reason was because Hans chose to be proud of me. It was the dream night of my life, and I think every girl in the school fell in love with my brother, who was cool enough, kind enough, and self-confident enough to take his little sister to his junior prom. If, as the Japanese saying goes, one kind word can warm three summer months, think how many summer months were warmed by this single act of kindness. If you ever have something nice to say, don't let that thought just rot. Say it. Don't wait until people are dead to give them flowers. I would like to leave our discussion about the relationship bank account with a personal challenge for you. Pick one important relationship in your life that is damaged. Now, commit yourself to rebuild that relationship one deposit at a time. Remember, it may take months to build up what took months to tear down. But little by little, deposit by deposit, they'll begin to see that you are genuine, that you really want to be friends. I never said it would be easy, but I promise you it will be worth it. Now that you understand the relationship bank account, we're ready for habit four, think win-win, which will help you in your relationships. This happens as well to be my favorite habit. Think win-win is an attitude towards life, a mental frame of mind that says, I can win and so can you. Think win-win is habit number four and it is the foundation for getting along well with other people. Think win-win begins with the belief that we are all equal, that no one is inferior or superior to anyone else, and that no one really needs to be. Life really isn't about getting ahead of other people. It may be that way in business, in sports, or in school, but those are merely institutions that we've created. It's certainly not that way in relationships, and relationships, as we learned, are the stuff which life is made of. From my experience, the best way to understand win-win is to understand what win-win is not. Win-win is not win-lose, lose-win, or lose-lose. These are all common but poor attitudes towards life. Let's take a look at each one, starting with win-lose. Win-lose is an attitude towards life that says the pie of success is only so big, and if you get a big piece, there is less for me. So I'm going to make sure I get my slice first or that I get a bigger piece than you. Win-lose is competitive. I call it the totem pole syndrome. I don't care how good I am as long as I'm higher than you on the totem pole. Relationships, friendships, and loyalty are all second to winning the game, being the best, and having it your way. Lose-win looks prettier on the surface, but it's just as dangerous as win-lose. It's the doormat syndrome. Lose-win says, have your way with me, wipe your feet on me, everyone else does. 
Lose win is weak. It's easy to get stepped on. It's easy to be the nice guy. It's easy to give in all in the name of being a peacemaker. It's easy to let your parents have their way with you rather than to try to share your feelings with them. Lose Lose says, if I'm going down, then you're going down with me, sucker. After all, misery enjoys company. War is a great example of Lose Lose. Think about it. Whoever kills the most people wins the war. That doesn't sound like anyone ends up winning at all to me. Revenge is also Lose Lose. By taking revenge, you may think you're winning, but you're really hurting yourself and somebody else. Win-win is a lot different than win-lose, lose-win, or lose-lose. In win-win relationships, you care about other people and you want them to succeed. But you also care about yourself and you want to succeed as well. There's plenty of success to go around. Win-win is like an all-you-can-eat buffet. There's more than enough for everyone. So how do you do it? How can you develop a win-win attitude towards life? First, win the private victory. If you are extremely insecure, and haven't paid the price to win the private victory, it will be very difficult to think win-win, believe me. Personal security is the foundation for thinking win-win. It all begins with you. Another way to think win-win is to avoid two very negative habits that, just like tumors, can slowly eat you away from the inside out. They are twins, and their names are competing and comparing. It's virtually impossible to think win-win with them around. Don't get me wrong here. Competition can be extremely healthy. Without it, we would never know how far we could push ourselves. Competition is very healthy when you compete against yourself or when it challenges you to reach and stretch and become your best. However, competition becomes dark when you tie your self-worth into winning or when you use it as a way to place yourself above another person. Let's use competition as a benchmark to measure ourselves against, but let's stop competing over status friends, popularity, and other things, and start enjoying life. Comparing is competition's twin sister. Building your life upon how you stack up compared to others is never good footing. If I get my security from the fact that my GPA is higher than yours, then what happens when someone comes along with a higher GPA than me? The only good comparison, really, is comparing yourself against your own potential. I once interviewed a girl named Anne who got caught up in the web of comparisons for many years but luckily managed to eventually escape. She has a message for those who are caught. Here's her story. Most of my problems began during my freshman year when I entered Clayton Valley High School. Most of the kids in my high school had money and how you dressed was everything. There were even some unspoken rules about clothes such as never wear the same thing twice and never wear the same thing as someone else. Brand names and expensive jeans were a must. During my freshman year, I picked up a boyfriend who was a junior and whom my parents didn't like. Our relationship was good at first, but after a while, he began to make me feel self-conscious. He would say things like, Why can't you look like her? How come you're so fat? If you just changed a little bit, you'd be just right. Well, I began to believe my boyfriend, and I started looking at other girls and analyzing all the reasons I wasn't as good as them. After a while, who I was hinged upon who I was with, what I looked like, and what kind of clothes I had on. I never felt good enough for anyone. To cope, I started to binge and purge. The eating gave me comfort, and the purging gave me some strange form of control. It soon became a big part of my life, I would do it at school, in the bathrooms, and anywhere else I could find. It was my secret. Finally, it all came to a head. While I was on stage performing in a play, I suddenly became totally disoriented and passed out. Waking up in the dressing room, I found my mom at my side. I need help, I whispered. Admitting that I had a problem was the first step to my recovery, which took several years. Looking back now, I can't believe I got myself into that state of mind. I had everything I needed to be happy, yet I was so miserable. I want to shout out to the world, don't ever do this to yourself. It's not worth it. The key to my recovery was meeting some really special friends that made me feel that I mattered because of who I was and not what I wore. 
And then I began to change for myself, not because someone else told me that I had to change to be worthy of their love. The pearl of wisdom from this story is stop doing it. Break the habit. Comparing yourself can become an addiction as strong as drugs or alcohol. Don't get caught up in the game and worry so much about being popular during your teen years because most of life comes after. Sometimes, no matter how hard you try, you won't be able to find a win-win solution. In these situations, if you can't find a solution that works for both of you, decide not to play. For example, if you and your friend can't decide what to do one night, instead of doing an activity that one of you might resent, split up tonight and get together another night. Developing a win-win attitude is not easy, but you can do it. Eventually, it will become a mental habit and you won't even have to think about it. It will become part of who you are. Habit 4 is all about developing a win-win attitude towards relationships. Habit 5 is the skill. We call it seek first to understand, then to be understood. The key to communication and having power and influence with people can be summed up in one simple sentence. Seek first to understand, then to be understood. In other words, listen first, talk second. This is habit five, and it works. If you can learn this simple habit, a whole new world of understanding will be opened up to you. I guarantee it. Why is this habit the key to communication? It's because the deepest need of the human heart is to be understood. The problem is, most of us don't know how to listen. Sometimes we space out and don't hear a word of what they're saying, or we pretend to listen by nodding our heads and saying things like, uh-huh, cool, sounds great. Sometimes when we listen to another person, we hear only what we want to hear, or we listen to the words and not to the body language and miss out on what's really being said. When we listen from our point of view, we usually reply in ways that make the other person immediately clam up. Fortunately, there is a form of listening which leads to real communication. I call it genuine listening. But to do genuine listening, you need to do three important things. First, listen with your eyes, heart, and ears. Listening with just your ears isn't good enough because only 7% of communication is contained in the words we use. The rest comes from body language and how we say words or the tone and feeling reflected in our voice. Second, to become a genuine listener, you need to take off your shoes and stand in another's. You must try to see the world as they see it and try to feel as they feel. A third way to become a genuine listener is to practice what I call mirroring. What does a mirror do? It doesn't judge, it doesn't advise, it reflects. Mirroring is simply repeating back in your own words what the other person is saying and feeling. Let's take a look at an everyday conversation to see how mirroring works. Your dad might say to you, No, you can't take the car tonight, son, and that's final. A typical seek-first-to-talk response might be, You never let me take the car, Dad. I always have to get a ride, and I'm sick of it. This kind of response usually ends up in a big yelling match where neither side feels very good afterwards. Instead, try mirroring. Repeat back in your own words what the other person is saying and feeling. Let's try this scenario again. No, you can't take the car tonight, son, and that's final. I can see that you're upset about this, Dad. You bet I'm upset. The way your grades have been dropping lately, you don't deserve the car. You're worried about my grades, Dad? I am. You know how badly I want you to get into college. College is really important to you, isn't it? I never had the chance to go to college, and I've never been able to make much money because of it. I know money's not everything, but it sure would help right now. I just want a better life for you, son. I see. You are so capable that it just drives me crazy when you don't take school seriously. I guess you can take the car tonight if you promise me you'll do your homework later tonight. That's all I'm asking. Promise? By practicing the skill of mirroring, the boy was able to uncover the real issue. Dad didn't care so much about him taking the car. He was more worried about his future and his casualness towards school. Once he felt that his son understood how important grades and college and his future were to him, he dropped his defenses. Now, I can't guarantee that mirroring will always lead to such perfect outcomes. Dad might have said, I'm glad you understand where I'm coming from, son. Now go to your homework. But I can guarantee that mirroring will be a huge deposit into another's relationship bank account. After you seek to understand, 
then seek to be understood. This is the second half of habit five, and it's just as important as the first half, but it requires something different from us. Seeking first to understand requires consideration, but seeking to be understood, speaking up, requires courage. Only practicing the first half of habit five, the listening part, is weak. Yet, it's an easy trap to fall into, especially with parents. This isn't healthy. You've got to share your feelings or they're going to eat your heart out. Well, that should pretty much wrap it up for habit five. I don't have a lot more to say about this habit except you have two ears and one mouth. Use them accordingly. Once you've developed a win-win attitude and you've learned how to listen to other people, you're now ready for habit six, synergize. What does synergize mean? Synergy is when two or more people work together to create a better solution than either could alone. It's not your way and it's not my way, but a better way, a higher way. Synergy isn't anything new. A good band is a great example of synergy. It's not just the drums or the guitar or the sax or the vocalist. It's all of them together that make up the sound. Each band member brings his or her strengths to the table to create something better than each could alone. Synergy doesn't just happen, it's a process. You have to get there. And the foundation of getting there is this, learn to celebrate differences. When we hear the word diversity, we typically think of racial and gender differences. But there is so much more to it, including differences in dress, language, wealth, religious beliefs, lifestyle, age, and on and on. The truth is, celebrating diversity is a struggle for most of us. For example, you may appreciate racial and cultural diversity and in the same breath look down upon someone because of the clothes they wear. It's important not only to celebrate the diversity of others, but also to value your own diversity. For example, I have three brothers. When I was younger, I was always trying to prove to myself that my talents were better than theirs. I've since seen the stupidity of that kind of thinking, and I'm learning to appreciate the fact that they have their strengths and I have mine. No one is better or worse, only different. Instead of trying to blend in and be like everyone else, be proud of and celebrate your unique differences and qualities. Once you've bought into the idea that differences are a strength and not a weakness, and once you're committed to at least try to celebrate differences, you're ready to find the highway. Whether you're arguing with your parents over dating and curfew guidelines or planning a school activity with your peers, there is a way to get to synergy. Here's a simple five-step process to help you get there. This is what I call the Getting to Synergy Action Plan. Step one, define the problem or opportunity. Step two, seek first to understand the ideas of others. Step three, seek to be understood by sharing your ideas. Step four, brainstorm to create new options and ideas. And step five, find the best solution or the highway. If you follow this basic five-step formula, you'll be amazed at what can happen. Listen to how this young lady, an 11th grader, got to Synergy. Prom was coming up, and I wanted to wear a certain style dress that I had found in a fashion magazine. The only problem was that it was short on me, because I'm real tall. I knew my mother would flip. I showed her the dress in the magazine, and as I had anticipated, she said, absolutely not. It's way too short. I let her voice her opinion about what she thought I ought to do and where I should shop. I didn't like anything she had to say, but it was obvious that she felt very strong about it. Then we started brain dumping ideas of what I could do. And one of the ideas was to find a seamstress and see if she could sew something that would satisfy us both. Soon we were drawing up our ideas and shopping for fabric and pattern. The outcome was beautiful, very personal, and different than everyone else's dress. We're now to our last part, part four, renewal. This is where Habit 7, Sharpen the Saw, comes into play. Do you ever feel stressed out or empty inside? If so, you're just going to love Habit 7 because it was specially designed to help you deal with these symptoms. Why do we call it Sharpen the Saw? Well, imagine that you're going for a walk in the forest when you come upon a guy who is sawing down a tree furiously. What are you doing, you ask? I'm sawing down a tree. 
comes the curt reply. Well, how long have you been at it? Four hours so far, but I'm really making progress, he says, sweat dripping from his chin. Your saw looks really dull, you say. Why don't you take a break and sharpen it? I can't, you idiot. I'm too busy sawing. We all know who the real idiot here is, now don't we? If the guy were to take a 15-minute break to sharpen his saw, he'd probably finish three times faster. Habit 7, Sharpen the Saw, is all about keeping your personal self sharp so that you can better cope with and deal with life. Habit 7 means regularly renewing and strengthening the four key dimensions of your life, your body, your heart, your mind, and your soul. Let's explore these four dimensions, beginning with your body. During your teenage years, your voice will change, your hormones will run rampant, and curves and muscles will begin springing up all over. Actually, this ever-changing body of yours is really quite a marvelous machine. You can handle it with care, or you can abuse it. In short, your body is a tool, and if you take good care of it, it will serve you well. The four key ingredients to a healthy body are good sleeping habits, physical relaxation, good nutrition, and proper exercise. Let's focus here for a minute on nutrition and exercise. You know, there's a lot of truth to the expression, you are what you eat. I'm not an expert in nutrition, but I have found two rules of thumb to keep in mind. First rule of thumb is, listen to your body. Pay careful attention to how different foods make you feel, and from that, develop your own handful of do's and don'ts. Everyone responds differently to food. The second rule of thumb is, be moderate and avoid extremes. Extreme eating habits can be unhealthy and are difficult to maintain over the long haul. A little junk food on occasion isn't going to hurt you. Just don't make it your everyday meal. Hand in hand with good nutrition is proper exercise. Besides being good for your heart and lungs, exercise has an amazing way of giving you a shot of energy, melting stress away, and clearing up your mind. For best results, you should exercise continually for 20 to 30 minutes at least three times a week. Don't let pain be the first thing that comes into your mind when you hear the word exercise. Instead, find something you enjoy doing so that it's easy to maintain. But be careful. In your quest for a better physique, make sure you don't get too obsessed with your appearance. If you're struggling with an eating disorder, don't feel alone. It's a very common problem among teens. Admit you have a problem and go get some help. Just as there are ways to care for your body, there are also ways to destroy it. And using addictive substances such as alcohol, drugs, and tobacco is a great way to do it. And then there's smoking, which has been proven to cloud your eyes, cause your skin to prematurely age, yellow your teeth, cause bad breath, create tiredness, and cause cancer. Perhaps the worst thing about picking up an addiction is this. You are no longer in control. Your addiction is. We always think that addiction is something that happens to someone else and that we could quit any time, right? In reality, it's very, very hard. As an example, only 25% of teen tobacco users who try to quit are successful. Believe me, you're not missing out on anything if you stay away from this stuff. If you don't smoke, drink, or do drugs, why even start? If you do, why not get help and quit? We're now to our last part, part four, renewal. This is where Habit 7, Sharpen the Saw, comes into play. Do you ever feel stressed out or empty inside? If so, you're just going to love Habit 7 because it was specially designed to help you deal with these symptoms. Why do we call it Sharpen the Saw? Well, imagine that you're going for a walk in the forest when you come upon a guy who is sawing down a tree furiously. What are you doing, you ask? I'm sawing down a tree, comes the curt reply. Well, how long have you been at it? Four hours so far, but I'm really making progress, he says, sweat dripping from his chin. Your saw looks really dull, you say. Why don't you take a break and sharpen it? I can't, you idiot. I'm too busy sawing. We all know who the real idiot here is, now don't we? If the guy were to take a 15-minute break to sharpen his saw, he'd probably finish three times faster. Habit 7, Sharpen the Saw, is all about keeping your personal self sharp so that you can better cope with and deal with life. Habit 7 means regularly renewing and strengthening the four key dimensions of your life, your body, your heart, your mind, and your soul. Let's explore these four dimensions, beginning with your body. 
During your teenage years, your voice will change, your hormones will run rampant, and curves and muscles will begin springing up all over. Actually, this ever-changing body of yours is really quite a marvelous machine. You can handle it with care, or you can abuse it. In short, your body is a tool, and if you take good care of it, it will serve you well. The four key ingredients to a healthy body are good sleeping habits, physical relaxation, good nutrition, and proper exercise. Let's focus here for a minute on nutrition and exercise. You know, there's a lot of truth to the expression, you are what you eat. I'm not an expert in nutrition, but I have found two rules of thumb to keep in mind. First rule of thumb is, listen to your body. Pay careful attention to how different foods make you feel, and from that, develop your own handful of do's and don'ts. Everyone responds differently to food. The second rule of thumb is, be moderate and avoid extremes. Extreme eating habits can be unhealthy and are difficult to maintain over the long haul. A little junk food on occasion isn't going to hurt you. Just don't make it your everyday meal. Hand in hand with good nutrition is proper exercise. Besides being good for your heart and lungs, exercise has an amazing way of giving you a shot of energy, melting stress away, and clearing up your mind. For best results, you should exercise continually for 20 to 30 minutes at least three times a week. Don't let pain be the first thing that comes into your mind when you hear the word exercise. Instead, find something you enjoy doing so that it's easy to maintain. But be careful. In your quest for a better physique, make sure you don't get too obsessed with your appearance. If you're struggling with an eating disorder, don't feel alone. It's a very common problem among teens. Admit you have a problem and go get some help. Just as there are ways to care for your body, there are also ways to destroy it. And using addictive substances such as alcohol, drugs, and tobacco is a great way to do it. And then there's smoking, which has been proven to cloud your eyes, cause your skin to prematurely age, yellow your teeth, cause bad breath, create tiredness, and cause cancer. Perhaps the worst thing about picking up an addiction is this. You are no longer in control. Your addiction is. We always think that addiction is something that happens to someone else and that we could quit any time, right? In reality, it's very, very hard. As an example, only 25% of teen tobacco users who try to quit are successful. Believe me, you're not missing out on anything if you stay away from this stuff. If you don't smoke, drink, or do drugs, why even start? If you do, why not get help and quit? So we've talked about the first key dimension in your life, caring for your body. Now let's talk about caring for your brain. The mental dimension of Habit 7, Sharpen the Saw, means developing brain power through your schooling, extracurricular activities, hobbies, and other mind-enlarging experiences. I once asked a group of teens in a survey, what are your fears? I was surprised by how many spoke about the stress of doing well in school, going to college, and getting a good job in the future. One teen said to me, what can we do to be certain that we can get a good job and support ourselves in the future? The answer is really rather simple. Develop an educated mind. By far, this offers your best chance of securing a good job and making a life for yourself. What's an educated mind? It's much more than a diploma on a wall, even though that's an important part of it. An educated mind can focus, synthesize, write, speak, create, and so much more. To do that, however, it must be trained. It won't just happen. I'd suggest you get as much education as you can. Statistics have shown that a college graduate earns about twice as much as a high school graduate, and the gap seems to be widening. Don't let a lack of money be the reason you don't get more education. You'd also be amazed at the number of scholarships, grants, loans, and student aid options that are available if you look around. While you may need to endure subjects you don't enjoy at school, find the subjects you do enjoy and build upon them. Don't let school be your only form of education. Let the world be your campus. If you ever get discouraged with school, please don't drop out. You're bound to eventually find something you enjoy about school or something you're good at. In the end, the key to honing your mind will be your desire to learn. It's never too late to start educating yourself. If you can learn to think well, the future will be an open door of opportunity. In addition to caring for your body and brain, you have to care for your heart. Do you ever feel like you're the moodiest person in the world and that you can't control your emotions? If you do, then welcome to the club, because that feeling is pretty normal for teenagers. You see, your heart is a very temperamental thing, 
and that's why it needs constant nourishment and care just like your body does. The best way to sharpen the saw and nourish your heart is to focus on building relationships, to make regular deposits into your relationship bank account and into your own personal bank account. PBA and RBA deposits are very similar. Deposits you make into other people's accounts usually end up in your own account as well. As you set out each day, look for opportunities to make deposits and build lasting friendships. If you approach life this way, always looking for ways to build instead of tear down, you'll be amazed at how much happiness you can give to others and find for yourself. As you think about caring for your heart, here are a few other points to consider. First, think about sex and relationships. Sex is about a whole lot more than your body. It's also about your heart. In fact, what you do about sex may affect your self-image and your relationships with others more than any other decision you make. And it's okay to wait. Depression is another factor to consider when taking care of your heart. It's totally normal to feel depressed at times, but there is a big difference between a case of the blues and sustained depression. If life has become a real pain for a long period of time, and you can't seem to shake that feeling of hopelessness, things are serious. Fortunately, depression is treatable. Don't hesitate to get help. If you are having thoughts of suicide, please listen closely to what I'm saying. Hold on for dear life. Bad times will pass. They always do. Someday, you will look back on your situation and you will be glad that you held on, as was the case with this young lady. I'm one of the many young people who comes from a wonderful home, and I don't really have any reason to have gotten in trouble, but I did. Friends became very important to me in junior high and high school, and home life seemed very boring. Within two years, I probably tried every vice in the book, and it didn't make me feel any better. On the contrary. I began having trouble even coming home. They all seemed so darn good and perfect and I felt like I couldn't fulfill their expectations. I began to wish I was dead. Then the thought led to actual suicide attempts. I kept a journal, and it really scares me today to see how close I came to ending it all. Today, just a few years later, I'm in college getting straight A's, I have a happy social life, I have a boyfriend who loves me very much, and I have a great relationship with my family. I have so many plans, so many things I'm going to do. I love life. I have so much to live for. I can't believe that I ever felt different. But I did. Thank heavens, I'm still here. Remember that the struggles you are now facing will eventually become a great source of strength for you. Now that we've covered caring for your body, brain, and heart, we've come to the fourth dimension in your life caring for your soul. By soul, I mean that inner self that lurks far below the surface of your everyday self. Your soul is your center, wherein lie your deepest convictions and values. Sharpening the saw in the spiritual area of life means taking time to renew and awaken that inner self. Your soul is a very private area of your life. Naturally, there are many different ways to feed it. Here are a couple of soul nourishing techniques to especially consider. One is getting back to nature. There is something magical about getting into nature that just can't be matched. I once interviewed a young man named Ryan who learned about the healing powers of Mother Nature in the midst of a really messed up home life. This is his story. At one point during high school, I went through a dark period where it seemed that everything just caved in. That's when I found the river hole. It was just to bank off some trees in the back of an old farmer's place and didn't look like much, but it became my escape. There was no one around. You couldn't hear people. It was beautiful. Any time I was stressed out, I'd go there. It was like my life could come back to normal. Some people turn to organized religion for direction, but it's been hard for me to turn to religion. I do have a religion, and I'm strong in it, but sometimes it's just hard for me to get up and go to church. But by going to the river, that place didn't judge me. That place didn't tell me what to do. It was just there. And by following its example, the peacefulness and the serenity that existed there, that's all I needed to calm things down. It made me feel like everything was going to work out. 
Like getting into nature, keeping a journal can do wonders for your soul. It can become your solace, your best friend, the only place where you can fully express yourself. You can pour out your heart in your journal, and it will just sit there and listen. Writing down your unedited thoughts can clear your mind, boost your confidence, and help you find yourself. Sharpening the saw won't just happen to you. Since it's a quadrant two activity, important, but not urgent, you have to be proactive and happen to it. The best thing to do is to take out time each day to sharpen the saw, even if it's only for 15 or 30 minutes. Some teens set apart a specific time each day, early in the morning, after school, or late at night, to be alone, to think, to exercise, to in some way sharpen their saw. Others like to do it on the weekends. There's no one right way to do it, so find what works for you. We've now been through all the habits, but before I close this program, I'd like to share a couple other thoughts with you. Several years ago, the Reverend Jesse Jackson spoke at the Democratic National Convention. He delivered a powerful message that set the convention on fire. He only used three words, keep hope alive. He kept saying these same words over and over and over for what seemed forever. Keep hope alive. Keep hope alive. The crowd swelled with applause. You could feel the sincerity in his voice. He inspired everyone. He created hope. That's why I made this program, to give you hope. Hope that you can change, kick an addiction, improve an important relationship. Hope that you can find answers to your problems and reach your fullest potential. So what if your family life stinks, you're failing school, and the only good relationship you have is with your cat? Keep hope alive. If you feel overwhelmed and don't even have a clue where to start, I'd suggest doing this. Ask yourself, which habit or habits am I having the most difficult time living? Then choose just two or three things to work on. You'll be amazed at the results a few small changes can bring to your life. Gradually, you'll increase in confidence, you'll feel happier, and your relationships will improve. It all begins with a single step. If you ever find yourself falling short, don't get discouraged. Remember the flight of an airplane. When an airplane takes off, it has a flight plan. However, during the course of the flight, turbulence, air traffic, human error, and many other factors keep knocking the plane off course. The key is that the pilots keep making small course corrections by reading their instruments and talking to the control towers. As a result, a plane reaches its destination. If you keep getting knocked off your flight plan, so what? If you just keep coming back to your plan and keep making small adjustments, and if you just will keep hope alive, you'll eventually reach your destination. Well, this is the end of the program. Thank you for taking this journey with me, and congratulations on finishing. Always remember, you were born with everything you need to succeed. You don't have to look anywhere else. The power and the light is in you. Before signing off, I'd like to leave you with this favorite quote of mine by a guy named Bob Moad. You can't make footprints in the sands of time by sitting on your butt. And who wants to leave butt prints in the sands of time? I wish you all the best. Sayonara. The Seven Habits of Highly Effective Teens was written and read by Sean Covey. It was abridged for audio by Allison Chernow. The recording engineer was Dan Carlisle. Editing and post-production by Dion Audio. The mix was by Linda Woolman. The associate producer was Sloan Seaman. The Seven Habits of Highly Effective Teens was produced and directed by Linda Woolman. This has been a presentation of Simon & Schuster Audio. Also available from Simon & Schuster Audio, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, and Living the Seven Habits, written and read by Stephen R. Covey. The Seven Habits of Highly Effective Teens is available in paperback from Fireside.